He tried to shoot me. The bastard, he tried to shoot all of us. Damn you, John Johnson, you had it coming for you. Still, I never seen a man's neck twisted at an angle like that. Hells. I'll have to work hard to blot out that picture from my mind. Better push it far back down or I'll never be able to set my foot on a skyscraper again. I'd like to think that I'd done the town a favor. A damn fine one, too. And they deserve to hear about it. But damn, Chip Johnson. What happened to him was... That was just the stuff of nightmares. Good thing I'm here to work things out. <laughs> yeah, Benny Clyde Rosberg coming to the rescue. If only you could see me now, Dad. Magnus Rosberg. If anyone did, you knew how to set the bar high for yourself. <laughs> Be damned if I won't do the same. I'll find out what happened to Susie. And if our people by the woods could know more about what's going on down there with this... This man in the scuba diving suit. Then I'll make sure they all know who it is gonna save the town. Benny Clyde Rosberg. Yeah, that's me. This is Red Moon Roleplay. We return to Denton, Alabama. For terror at Makeout Point. When last we left our heroes, Agent Faulkner and Dr. White had just entered Faulkner's secret bunker, a hidden laboratory on the outskirts of town. When there, Faulkner had made contact with the FBI to inform them, yes, he had made contact with the aliens. Dr. White was frankly agog, not at Faulkner's contact with the FBI, or indeed uh, the fact that Faulkner already had knowledge of these aliens, but the size of this laboratory, the experiments he could perform down here now that he had a fresh piece of the alien that was Chip Johnson in a vial at his side. BC, however, has embarked on a significantly more dangerous adventure. Trying to retrace the steps of Susie Wilkins, the girl that escaped the attack at Makeout Point, he is now walking alone through the woods, knocking on doors, trying to find out why no one would admit her on the night that she was so terrified. And it's at that point that he sees a figure in the tree line, some distance away. It looks like a man, maybe a woman, in a diving suit, just as Susie Wilkins described, the individual that attacked her, that raked her, that cut her open. And he's all alone out in these woods. His car is far back on the track now. And it is to be see that we will Go first. Rain starts to fall. I squint through the rain and I clutch the baseball bat in my hand and I'm thinking, surely that couldn't have been that. It was actually a person, a person walking around in a, in a diving suit. I'm just, I'm just seeing things and I... Despite myself, I give a shudder. I'm seeing things because I heard of them. Yeah. As you squint away the rain that's now falling quite heavily, the figure in the distance has disappeared from your view. You can't help but feel that with the cracking of branches and squelching of mud around you that could just be wind, could be branches, could be errant wildlife. This thing could be circling around to get closer. I feel that fear creeping up my spine and I, I whip around. What was that? What was that sound? Oh, 
he yells. But I don't see anything around me now. No, indeed. There's a house in the distance. None of the lights are on. But you'd probably have to cross the path of this man in a diving suit in order to get there. If, indeed, the individual is still there or ever was there. You can, of course, just return to your car and flee the scene. I swallow hard and, uh, even at this point, the sound of the ringing bicycle bell of little Charlie would have made me feel more comfortable. But, uh, it's just rain, just the cracking of the branches. Maybe this was a bad idea, and I turn around and I slowly start moving backwards again. As you head towards your car, cowardice infecting your soul, the worry now that not just the people of Denton but also these close companions you've formed in the last day or so will judge you for only poking your head into the woods before turning tail and fleeing, you hear a beep beep from your car. Someone's pressing the horn. What the hell? Someone... Someone's made it to my car. And I feel a hint of reassurance. Um, that, uh... And I'm starting to make up in my mind why I'm going back to my car without having visited the uh, the house. But if some other person is around here, that's... That's good. Okay, I can't... I, I gotta straighten my spine. I can't show myself getting scared this, this early on. Uh, and I start moving back to my car... With the beep uh, as an excuse to, to, to go back to it, yeah. As you trudge through the mud, which is very quickly becoming sticky and making your progress difficult and slow, you had forgotten what it was like in Denton when the uh, flash rain starts coming down. You can see the headlights of your car. It looks like someone has got in and turned over the engine and... Yeah, you can you can hear it's running, the lights are on, uh, there's no beeping coming from the uh, horn, but the driver's side door is now open. What the hell are they doing in my car? We're putting it on and everything? I, I get angry at this, and uh, my uh, sudden fear I, that I had before, it's... My feelings are getting mixed between being angry and being relieved, and I start trying to... Quicken my pace, despite this, despite this uh, sticky mud trying to s get me stuck with every step. You are within 20 yards of reaching your car. You can see it clean on the track now. You can't see anybody within it, but it's at that point that you hear behind you, not that far away, a sharp hiss that can best be described as similar to a large viper or maybe even a komodo dragon a hiss that you can just feel on the back of your neck it's warm it cuts into you i swing around with my bat just an adrenaline a flash of adrenaline pumping into me you see uh, the figure in the diver suit farther back than you would have imagined him or her or it now that you can actually see it a little clearer, though, you realise it's not a diver's suit at all. While it looks rubbery, while it looks mottled, maybe even scaled, it's not something man-made. This is a rubbery-looking, lizard-like creature. Its eyes, what you mistook for goggles, are just round and bulging. Its mouth that you had thought was some kind of uh, breath device, breathing apparatus, is in fact a wide maw showing many, too many for you to count from where you are right now, black teeth. And it is, indeed, hissing at you. Your eyes very quickly go to where its hands should be. And while they look humanoid, they do each end in incredibly sharp talons. It hisses again. It adopts a stance. You think it may well run at you right now. I shouted it. 
Stop right there! And to your surprise, it does. It doesn't spring forth. It holds its position. And its large, bulging eyes, they lock with your own. It hisses again. I grit my teeth with determination. This must have indeed been the thing that attacked Susie. Sure has the sharp talons or, or, or claws that would have made those marks. Nothing to be messed with for sure, and I... I feel a shiver down my spine, and I clutch the baseball bat even tighter, but I'm not averting my gaze. I'm trying to show that I'm standing my ground here. It starts moving towards you, but it's cautious. It's making small steps and moving to the side. It's like it's stalking you, trying to get the measure of you. And I try to square my shoulders. I try to look menacing, and I say, I just let out a big... I'd like you to make a roll, I think, if you're trying to scare it off. I think that would be fair. Yeah. I'm taking a little step forward with uh, one of my feet as I do this, yeah. Okay. I'll roll an 8 and a 10. Okay, uh, still a decent number of successes. The creature, as you brace yourself with the bat and you let out your roar, it starts backing up. And then it turns tail and runs into the trees. Disappears from sight quite easily and quickly camouflaged among the rain and the bracken. And as then you are suddenly jolted, you jump, ashamed of yourself for doing so, from the beep of your car. And you hear a voice from within. It's that young fan of yours, Charlie. Hey, BC, I found your car! And, uh, I uh, feel myself shaking with uh, the rush, the adrenaline, and not knowing for sure for a second there if what was going to happen. Uh, and I uh, look around and I said, Damn it, Charlie, what are you doing? I, t turning on my engine and my lights? Do you even know how to use a car? I, I, I don't, BC, but I was, I was mighty cold, and you said you were going to meet me out by the house, and you didn't, so I followed the car out here. Well, I didn't see you there, and I look around one last time to see if uh, th this creature is any anywhere in visibility. Ooh, well, as you're looking, let's go for, hmm, I think we'll go for an integrity and cunning roll, please. Right, I get one nine. Okay, you scan across the, uh, the woodland to see if you can spot this lizard creature and you cannot see it uh, anywhere within sight. Hopefully that means it's fled all the way back to wherever it nests and that it isn't hiding in plain sight or hasn't circled around you to the other side of your car. I don't feel completely safe, but I don't see it. I give out a breath and... Uh, I loosen my grip on the baseball bat, just flexing my arm a bit, and I walk down over to Charlie in the car. He's in the passenger seat, quite happily sat there. He put the heating on but left the door open, which kind of defeats the object, and had clearly been beeping the horn to signal your attention. Uh, but he's just sat there. You can actually see, uh, we've been describing it as a car, but we can see that the pickup has got a uh, his bicycle in the back. He obviously lifted it and just placed it in there. Like I said, I was very cold, and then it started to rain, so I, I thought, I'll get in and wait for you. I see, Charlie. Well, that's uh, it's mighty considerate of you running, uh, getting on your bike and going all the way out here. What was it you said about things you wanted to show me? Oh, well, yeah, sure. And he um, opens a little satchel that he has at his side. Are you climbing into the uh, pickup with him now? Yeah, I'm uh, climbing in and I'm closing the door and just having the wipers on, keeping 
a vague eye on what's going on outside. Well, I just thought you'd be so curious to see what I'd been taking photos of. I've been... It's, it gets boring out here sometimes, so I just like to take photos of animals. You got yourself a camera now? That's right. My daddy bought me a camera for my birthday. Well. Well. And I just got these photos here developed. And he, um... Hands you a small stack of photographs. Most of them are of uh, expected creatures, you know, the occasional deer, the occasional gator. Uh, that it appears he's far getting far too close to. Um, but then there is something. Well, you've never seen before. You were half expecting to see the creature that you were just confronted with. But that isn't what you find yourself looking at. You find yourself looking at a... What can best be described as a mound of bubbles and eyeballs. Just iridescent spheres. And the photo is taken looking into a drain. And this, what could be runoff from pollution but looks far too organic for that. It's just there, all eyes looking up at the camera lens, and Charlie is looking at you with a big smile on his face. Look what I, look what I found. I flicker through the photos fairly quickly until I reach that one, and I just stop, and I ask him what the hell is that I'm and I realized I should watch my language uh, in front of this kid what wh what's what's that well I said what the hell as well mr. BC when I when I saw it because I thought is this something that comes from hell like the like the preacher tells us well it's I am thinking to myself that I'm starting to wonder this myself. What has uh, what has Denton done to deserve this kind of monstrosities showing up? When did you take this? Well, this was just the other day. I guess three or four days ago. I only got the uh, f film developed two days back. Um, my my daddy didn't want to see what I've been taking, so I was saving them for you when I heard you was back in town. And where did you find this? Well, I can show you to it. You know, uh, Mavis's diner just overlooking the uh, the cove. Uh, I guess it's a ways down from Make Out Point, but yeah, uh, this drain was just outside Mavis's, and I heard something. And he's got that big smile on his face as he's describing it. There's a mixture of pride and a certain amount of relish to go with it. I just heard this bubbling, gurgling down in the drain. And I guess I'm no expert, but I guess that's where everything from the diner runs down to the sea. And I just looked in and I saw all those eyes looking back at me. And I had my camera and I felt like I just had to take a photo. And I had to show people. I don't want to inflate his ego but I'm beside myself, just sitting there, just nodding, approvingly, looking at this photo, thinking to myself, this is a damn good photo of whatever the hell that is. Uh, say, uh, Charlie, do you mind if I keep this and show it to my friends that are here? His smile disappears. You can't keep it, it's mine. Well, I just want to show it to them. You get it back. I just borrow it, okay? Well, you take me as well, then. I, I ain't letting you take that photo. You could sell it to a newspaper. Well, you would, no, I th wouldn't think something like that about me. Wouldn't making money of you. Well, I trust you, BC, but that's like my prized possession. I feel, I feel like it's a part of me. And then the smile returns. Uh, and I feel to myself that this. Uh, could have sort of been me almost a few years back with his uh, 
stubbornness and uh, wanting to make something out of himself as well. I uh, guffaw a bit and I uh, say, well, all right then. I guess I'll have to take you to them and uh, and uh, you can show them yourself. Could you do uh, an integrity and composure, please? I got two nines. You only see it for a blink, but for a split second there, as you're looking into Charlie's eyes and he's looking right back at you, it's as if each of his sockets has two eyeballs in. But after you blink, there's only one each. Maybe it's because you stared at the photo for a little too long. Yeah. Yeah, I look down at the photo and I look at him again. Well, Charlie, yeah. Uh, I, uh, I, I look quickly look through the rest of the stack of the photos, but this is the one that stands out, I take it then? Uh, and I hand them back over to him, feeling wary and weary, still thinking to myself if I should try and make it up to that house or not. That thing, I clearly scared it off. Now I got Charlie with me as well that I want to prove myself to. I don't like feeling like I did the job halfways. Surely if I scared it off once, I could do it again. And uh, I'm looking out uh, through the windows. How's the the weather coming along? Is it... Uh, the rain is starting to ease up. These showers often only last a matter of minutes, sometimes maximum of 15 or 30, but it's easing off. Well, it surely is not helping with the sight, so maybe if I... if the When the shower stops, I could get out, and uh, maybe I'll have a better view if something should be approaching uh, anyways. So uh, I'll, I'll sit in there in the car with Charlie for a little while, uh, till the rain eases off. In that case, he asks you a question. So what what is you doing out, out of here, at, all by yourself? Well, Charlie, I'm sure you heard what happened to Susie and all that. Did you, did you hear about that? I heard she was attacked by a bear or something. Yeah, yeah, there was something out in the woods there that uh, she encountered when she was uh, having some kind of jog back from make-out point. Well, I said that's... That's poppycock. There ain't no bears out here. Nah, you know that. You're a clever boy, aren't you? No, it's something else. Yeah. Have you seen something, Charlie? No, I ain't seen nothing that, that do something like that, but I know that out here that there is things that like to maul people. My daddy told me. Yeah, there's things, all right. And, uh, I add, well, uh, I patched her up, I patched her up pretty, pretty decently. I'm sure the, uh, the other townsfolk have told you as well that I did a pretty good job there, uh, making sure to stop her bleeding so she could get to the ambulance safe, safely and uh, then to the sheriff. Well, that's why I wanted to find you, BC, because, well, some people are saying that you were a real local hero. Yeah, that's, uh... I, well, I wouldn't want to brag, you know. I'm, I'm just, you know, coming back and I was hoping that maybe while I'm here I could do something good for the town again. You know, like in the good old days. Uh, got some good... Uh, people People used to like what I did back then. Perhaps I could uh, help out with something even bigger. Well, I'll tell you what. If you've got time before you uh, take my photo to your friends, uh, shall I take you to that, that drain pipe? where I saw that thing, because I guess if if anyone can deal with it, it would be you. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'd, I'd love to have a look at that as well, and uh, maybe uh, say hello to the people at the, the diner as well. But you see, uh, why I'm out here is because uh, when Susie ran by, there's supposed to be some animal out here. I think I saw something in the woods, but uh, I wanted to just make sure that the, who was ever living here Whoever's living out here, what? Well, if they would know something, do you know who's that? Who that house is up there? Oh, that—that's Whitaker House up there. The, the, that family don't come out here, go, go into town much. You can see he's rattled. If you saw something out here, I think we should just go back into Denton. Well, you 
No, I'm I'm not scared. But something just walking around in the wood, I If there's something as strong as a bear, I don't think your baseball bat's gonna cut it. Well, I'm not sure it's a bear, like you said, it's probably something else. Probably something slithery and I make big eyes uh uh, trying to uh, scare him a little bit. He laughs at that. No, uh, but if you said uh, the Whitakers are not that very friendly towards outsiders, maybe maybe they don't have much to say. What do you think? No, the families that live in the old houses out in these woods, they don't like to come into Danton much at all. They look after their own. And the, the, the Whitakers up at that house, they're some of the oldest well, my, my daddy says there's some of the oldest bloods out here. That they have more water running through their veins than anything else. Well, good old salty sea people. Well, uh, if you say so, why um, why don't we take a little trip then? And you can show me this thing. Uh, I'll say hello to the people at the diner and uh, we make it an expedition. Yeah, let's do that. All right, Charlie, and I uh, start, start, uh, my car is already running, so I just start backing out of there and making my way down past Makeup Point and down to the diner. Okay, we cut to the laboratory. Indeed. I have been at work now for at least an hour. I am very keen to begin the initial investigations once again on this new element I found. I have, of course, also made myself familiar with the lab itself. I've gone to the agent and asked, Faulkner, have you got one of those... those computer devices? I bet you must have one somewhere here. You Americans have some good, good progress in that field, don't you? Well, I've been assured that everything is available in, in this lab. Um, let me go and see what we, what we have. But perhaps <laughs> you know better what we're looking for. I've... Not been big on that technical stuff. Well, a computer would enable us to conduct even more experiments than I had access to in my little lab. After all, they're fascinating things. Have you ever seen one? They make calculations that used to take weeks. You can do them in hours. Gigantic, of course. I wonder if they'll ever fix that, but for now, a very useful invention. Certainly sounds like it. Certainly sounds like it. Well, let's see what we have here. I, am. Um... I have, of course, finished my call now to Deputy Director Rosen reporting in. What, uh, what was the response that I got from my superiors? They told you to. They told you to hold fast. Um, so your communications with headquarters isn't just a simple telephone. Uh, you'd be sending some kind of telex uh, to Washington and waiting for a response. You got it, and that response told you to hold fast. More agents on the way. Excellent. That's good news. I feel reassured. What we faced was not something I... Well, I was lucky that my friends, my colleagues, if you will, were with me. Uh, if we face more of, of that, then we're going to need... A lot of Hoover boys with a lot of pistols. The laboratory is remarkably well furnished. Clearly the Bureau was at some point anticipating having to send multiple scientists down here to experiment on something or some things. And what they were planning on doing, you don't know the full breadth of, but you do know that whatever it was, the samples were supposed to be located in Denton and kept in Denton, hence the positioning of the laboratory. That would imply whatever it is too dangerous to actually transport across America. I wonder, are there any holding facilities? Not for a person, I mean things you could contain something in, like an airtight chamber or even a small uh, version. Oh yes, there is definitely an airtight uh, chamber for chemical experiments, and uh, the, your your basic uh, tools and equipment that you'd expect to find in any lab uh, are all readily available here. Excellent, excellent. I will remark to the agent, this is going to be very useful. 
I have already requested more things myself. Expensive things, but they will be arriving. Largely for the investigations of the caves themselves. For example, some equipment if we require diving. Some places to enforce things if we need it. And of course, my own, well, some more scientists. A biologist especially would be useful. It's not completely my field of expertise, you understand. I understand. And I'm pleased that the... That you're finding use in, in, in this uh, lab. I hope we can come to the bottom of what's going on here and uh, understand this organism better. I believe that it can be of great use to our country. It certainly could be, although one thing does occur to me, Agent. I'm sure you might agree. And I walk over and lean in. This is a discovery, but I'm willing to believe we are not the first to make it. Even your government seems to be already aware of it. And then, of course, the townspeople. You're familiar, of course, with your country's history in regard to the gold mines, yes? Back in the days where random people, peasants, would find gold and kill to keep it hidden as long as possible, yes? Of course. I wonder if we have a similar situation. Perhaps whatever lies in those caves locals maybe know more than they're letting on. Maybe they wish to keep it for themselves. After all, they are uneducated and probably have no idea what they're actually dealing with. I believe that's true. We certainly had a run in with the Johnson family to base that off of. I do not believe that they can be trusted. I grew up with a lot of these people, but somehow something is different and uh, I suppose even back then there were secrets. There seems to be even more now. We best not trust anyone. I agree, but we will need more information than we can get just in a lab. Use your clout and see if we can't get town records or, or various scriptures. Anything the town might have that maybe give us some more information. It could be useful. Another memo starts emerging from your printer. Uh, it's clearly something ca uh, being sent from DC. I go to see what it is. It is a request. It asks, answer in quick, short responses. Have you made contact with the organism? Do you possess the organism? Do you possess a piece of the organism? How many others have made contact with the organism? Are they with you now? I frown a little as I see this coming through, but I look to the agent and remark, Well, Agent Falconer, I suppose you have to report in. Yes, I had better do that. Then I start replying. Contact established. Sample of organism secured. Organism itself not secured. Others who have encountered two currently with me. You send off your memo and it's not three minutes before you get your response, which is quite clear. Do not move from your current location. And that is it? Yep. Well, I uh, take the printout and I uh, put it away and I go to the doctor. I suppose we'd better stay here and find out everything that we can find out from, uh, from this sample. Learn what can be learned. I would agree, although you might want to make sure our dear boy PC is also here. Might cause complications if they <laughs> don't find our other member. But yes, we should stay here for now, that suits me just fine. However, would you be willing to give me a sample of your blood, Agent? Why, certainly. It occurs to me, at this point from now on, we should take care in regards to possible contamination. I don't know if it's important, but it might be. After all, we were quite close to this organism. 
Yes. Yes, I think actually I shall conduct some tests on ourselves as well, just to make sure all's well. No contaminants in the blood, that sort of thing. Seems like a, a good course of action. I cooperate with that. And I shall begin not only conducting initial testing on the sample, but also running a few health checks on myself and the agent. Of course, I'm not really a medicine doctor, so I don't know anything advanced, but I do feel I would at least know things that could be seen as contamination or something unusual. Hopefully, anyway. Yeah, you should know what a uh, human cell looks like without... uh, And likewise, what human blood should look like under a microscope. Indeed. Okay, Uh, so what test do you want to do first? We're going to make some successive rolls. Let's test ourselves first. Very good. Uh, Science and intellect, please. That will be ten dice. Nine successes. On nine successes on this roll, you are prudent enough to check not just the blood, but also hair and skin samples. You, uh, do, you run the full gamut of tests that you can without being intrusive. And what you find is, on one hand, reassuring, on the other, worrying. Your blood, in both cases, comes back clean. Uh, Likewise, your hair uh, seems to be fine. Nothing is getting into the oils. But when it comes to your skin, and you take a sample both from skin that did make contact with Chip Johnson and skin that... uh, that did not, and the skin that did make contact with the wet creature is showing some strange chemistry underneath your microscope. It's hard to say what's going on, but it appears that the microscopic cells that used to make up this wet fluid are trying to replicate the skin underneath them. Uh, and it's not doing it terribly effectively. Perhaps it's because there aren't enough of these wet cells to perform the job, but the natural uh, resistance of the human cellular organism is enough to prevent it from receiving any kind of uh, direct duplication. Uh, So cells occasionally appear, new ones, but they're immediately dead. The way this actually affects, let's say, your hands or arms, if you were to examine them under a microscope, is you start developing an excess of flaky skin uh, on those exposed portions where something is trying to copy the skin underneath and it's failing. And so you're building up an excess of dead skin. Fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. I inform the agent of this. Agent Faulkner. I believe from this point onwards we must make sure not to directly encounter this being of the skin. I believe we are okay for now, don't worry. But even those traces that we had on us earlier have left a bit of a mark. I believe it's almost as if they try and replicate the cells they come in contact with, possibly duplicating. I wonder, did it look like Chip Johnson because it was trying to become him or make a copy of him? This is absolutely fascinating stuff. I must not write this down. That does sound uh, exactly like what happened. Hmm, Very good. Very good findings, Doctor. And so quickly, too. And it's with this. Possibly for later in this scene, but could I use one of those successes to do a stunt? Uh, I I would say so. You could do multiple stunts with that number of successes. Well, to keep it simple for now, I'm wondering if I could use this knowledge. And hopefully the knowledge upcoming to maybe create some Bane bullets. 
I'm already thinking of things that might be a weakness to this organism, and it would be, might be useful if we have the time, which it seems we might, to modify the agent's weaponry ever so slightly. Well, how so? Um, what what kind of weaponry are you intending on making? You're just intending on making bullets that this creature is particularly vulnerable to. Indeed. I don't think I have the resources to make brand new bullets, but I do have chemicals. I wonder if I could somehow just make his bullets have slightly more heat-like properties to them. Evaporation's what I'm thinking of. The creature seems to thrive on salt water. Perhaps the opposite would be harmful. Maybe. So this would actually come through multiple tests. We'll say they take you around an hour in total to come up with something that is uh, particularly effective. But after exposing the fluid that you have managed to capture to various elements to see what it is uh, vulnerable to, what it seems resistant to, and so on, you uh, discover that injecting a highly uh, combustible element such as cesium or potassium into this fluid makes it flare up instantly, as you would expect it would when contacting with water. But there appears to be a chain reaction. It jumps from cell to cell, and it burns through like a, uh, like a fuse, leading to a bomb. And so, yes, you could tamper with the agent's bullets, so you could modify them in that way by uh, putting a little bit of explosive element in, but it could potentially lead to them being unstable. Yes, I will inform the agent of this work, after all it takes, as you said, hours. But I will inform him what I'm doing and maybe imply that this is something to be used as a last resort. Something to keep on hand, maybe then, rather than his default weaponry. Yes, uh, in terms of mechanics, I will allow you to use the, these weapons, uh, but what it will mean difficulty-wise is every shot you take will have an increased threshold of difficulty by one. Uh, if you make a dramatic failure during any of that, uh, your weapon is likely to explode in your hands. Indeed, that sounds good to me, and I will of course make sure... Agent Falconer is fully aware that what I'm doing is very experimental, very dangerous. We should only use it if strictly necessary. Yes. Well, my uh, my normal bullets were uh, able to take the target down. So, uh, if we're put in a truly dangerous situation, then having this uh, as a last resort can be very useful. So, well done, Doctor. This will help. Of course. And now perhaps a role for my general examinations of the sample. Primarily, I wish to put it in one of those containment areas and risk just a little bit of salt water exposure. Very good. Uh, let's go for another science and intellect, please. That time only two successes. Uh, you uh, experiment adding some salt water to the creature. Uh, to see whether it will make it expand, whether it will uh, give it any increased vitality. And sure enough, as your expectations bear out, the depending on the mixture of salt and water, the it's not actually the same mixture you'd expect from the sea. The salt content has to be substantially higher, but when it is, the creature explodes into action. There, again, isn't enough fluid in the containment tank to create a threat, but this thing starts expanding with tendrils and stretching across the surface area, uh, almost like a spider's web. It just starts lamping out, trying to clamp on to different parts of the containment and just starts threading its way through. But it's all very thin. You think you could quite easily cut through it, not that you probably would, with a hand. Uh, but it's 
trying to form some kind of structure, whether it's a humanoid body, you can't tell. It just doesn't have enough substance to it to allow it. You can pour more water, more salt water in, if you want. I shall. However, I've also set up the containment area so that with the findings I found in regard to its weakness, I can very quickly inject the chemicals required to cause this thing pain, hopefully, or at least stop it. Hopefully, anyway, but let us risk just a little more, just a little more salt water. What does Agent Faulkner think of this risk, just before you go ahead with this experiment? Well, I trust the Doctor. He has proven extremely capable, and he seems to be an expert in his field. I am, um, I think, going back to my relationship with him, where I, I do tend to respect my elders, uh, I think I will trust him to do, uh, to do what, is, what he believes is right here. In that case, I'm going to say, Agent Faulkner, you are responsible for injecting the creature with the lethal dose if it gets too dangerous. Now, what that means is the Doctor will gain an additional die due to the intensity of your relationship. Uh, therefore, Dr. White, another science and intellect role, if you please. Two successes. Two successes. You inject more of this mixture into the compartment the creature currently occupies. Its mass starts expanding. You can see, just briefly, within some of those tenderless threads, what appear to be tiny eyes or pupils, almost like frog spawn, making their way up and down the tendrils as if they were veins and these eyes were little blood cells trying to course around, find, trying to find a central organ and this creature lacks any such organ, but it does expand dramatically, dramatically quickly, as well as dangerously. Perhaps you injected a little too much into this chamber because now it's filling it up like water being poured into a jug and it looks like it's going to buckle against the glass, the reinforced glass containment. It looks like it could actually expand and break out of it and as in fact it does fill it all the way up to the top, you're not sure how far it's going to attempt to expand and whether the containment can indeed hold it. Are you going to allow it to continue or is Agent Faulkner going to push the plunger? No. No, I look at this... this process in an almost abject wonder, but as it grows more... I'm not a fool. I step back from the containment area and quickly remark to Faulkner, Faulkner! In inject the chemicals! Inject them now! And I nod and I quickly do the deed. Yeah, they travel down the... pipe. Enter... the containment area. And just as you hear a bolt spring off from the reinforced shielding around this area, clearly it is about to break free, there's a terrible stench that starts slipping out from the almost, well, it must be minuscule gap uh, that this thing has ruptured in the containment area. A horrible burning odour that is then just only passed with a terrible explosion. The glass shielding breaks free from the frames on either side, bursts free, but the creature inside does not escape. It has detonated. At a cellular level, it has just popped every single living cell in its body. It is dead at just the right moment. I sort of double back a little, leaning on my cane in alarm at the explosion. And I just sort of stand there staring. My god, did you see that, Faulkner? Did you see that? Yes. Whatever that thing is, it's... It's not of... Not of this earth. It's something else. At this point, I look to the rest of the sample. I didn't put it all in. Obviously, I didn't want to lose everything, possibly. That is now in a separate containment area. And I say, okay, 
We need to be very careful with this salt water. Agent salt water. Or something even more salty. It thrives on it. It replicates based on it. I wonder what would happen if it was actually... Maybe another time. Maybe maybe later. But, but actual organ or other matter interaction could be key here, Agent. But no, I've... I, I now notice the damage and think to myself, you'll need to tell them that we're going to need to reinforce this again. This will need to be fixed. Yes, I will do that. And I I marvel at the power that was in this organism. And I, I start imagining the military uses that this could find in our in our fight against our, our foes. It's not so surprising that it was able to blow the door off of a car. If this is how it is able to react to simple salt water, at a more advanced level, whether it can do this of its own volition to create detonations is also intriguing to you as a military application. Just as you're ruminating on the thought, you hear the buzz and click, click, click of another memo coming through. I go to read it. Send full names of individuals who have made contact with the organism. All right. Well, these are my people after all. I trust the Bureau. I shall send in my name. I shall send the doctor's name. I I don't have the doctor's full name, do I? You don't, but I will come over and read the memo over your shoulder and remark... Dr. Charles White, you should find that they are already aware of me. I'll be frank and say that I am here at your government's pleasure. I don't know which branch exactly, to be honest, you have so many here, but I am receiving my funding from your government, and that's why you were wondering where my incoming resources were coming from. Uncle Sam does provide. I put in Dr. Charles uh, White, and I also put in Benny Clyde Rosberg, my friend. And Mr. Rosberg is who we will return to now. You have driven with uh, Charlie Bjarkland to the diner, or are you heading to the bunker? Ultimately, you're the driver, so... Or are you going to the Whitaker house? No, we decided to abandon the Whitaker house for now, um, seeing how Charlie wasn't... I wasn't going to impress him with going up there anyway, and uh, he, he's got some interest in Leeds. I'd like to uh, announce myself in uh, as many places as possible while I'm here and doing some work on my own. And uh, also, I have a little flashy new, uh, well, cardboard badge. That I'd like to show off. So I'm heading down towards the diner. Very good. You head on your way to Mavis's. Mavis has been an institution in Denton for as long as you know. She and her mother run the diner out here. Probably one of the most successful businesses in Denton. Everyone stops by here for a piece of pie at least once a week. And it summarizes everything that is quintessential about small town America. It has your steel bar stools, it has your dollar milkshakes, it has a jukebox in the corner, and everything else that's good. Uh, the young people come to the diner, the old people go to Jimmy's Bar and Grill. They both share similar facets, but Mavis is definitely a cleaner, I uh, could say, more well-run establishment. It's fantastic. I s- come driving up to the diner, and uh, I hope uh, that there's some people in there that I could, uh, well, say hello to, maybe even impress with this. Um, slam the car door shut, and uh, as I make my way in, I take on the posture of a returning hero, or maybe even a sheriff entering a saloon, like in some kind of old western movie. As you're about to step across the door, Charlie calls from behind. He's left your uh, pickup, but he hasn't gone up the steps towards Mavis's. Uh, BC, don't you want to look in the drain first? Uh, well, uh, I'm, uh... I, I want to look in the drain, of course, but uh, I was thinking that while we're here, why don't we... Uh, Sit down for some uh, buttermilk chess pie, for example. You know, 
say hello to the townsfolk? His smile quavers a little. He says, oh, sure, yeah, wh- why not? I- I'll-, I'll have some pie. Right. I could uh, treat you to some coconut cake if you like. Mmm. Mavis's speciality. Isn't it now? So, I get back to what I was trying to do. Assuming my posture. I want to go in. I want to say hello. Hello to any familiar faces that I see along the way as I make my way up to the counter. Yeah, you see some people that you recognize. Uh, you work down at Lumberyard. Some of the fishermen. Some of the You don't recognize all the young people who are here. Uh, simply because it's been a while since you've lived here full time. But you definitely recognize Mavis behind the counter. She doesn't really look much older than when you last came to Denton. Uh, she's still that lady in her 50s. A uh, cigarette hanging from her mouth. Unlit, but always there. Mavis, how y'all doing this fan day? She blinks at you a few times before smiling. You're BC, ain't you? Well, that's right. I'm glad you remember me. Been a while since I was back home in good old Denton. Well, I heard you was at Jimmy's Bar and Grill the other night and you were doing some life saving. Good for you. <laughs> well, now, I can't take all the credit. There was uh, uh, this uh, FBI agent trying to help her out as well. But, you know, I, I do what I can uh, when I'm back in town. Mm-hmm. Well, I heard that that's Susie Wilkins gone and hurt herself. Yeah, but she'll be all right, don't you worry. We, 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 we made a good first job on her, so so she, she, she should be fine. Where is she now? Well, last time I saw her, she was first brought in to the sheriff, but surely they brought her to the hospital to have a, a, a thorough examination, make sure she's all good. Well, I heard that there ain't been no paramedics out here since the accident, so I don't know if she's gone up to the hospital. Maybe someone did drive her. Could have been, could have been. Or maybe uh, she just turned out to be all the better. I don't know. But I wanted to ask you, Mavis, uh, do you have any uh, buttermilk test pie? Always. And some coconut cake? Oh, yeah, for little Charlie here. Um, yeah, something uh, and a, perhaps a, a nice cup of coffee for the new uh, deputy in town. And I hold up the little paper uh, that I'd just been given. No, oh, sure, ain't that swell. I'll get you a whole pot of coffee. Oh, well, that's that's what I like to hear. Grab yourself a seat down there. Uh, yeah, feel free to put some music on the jukebox. She throws you a quarter. That's on me for going around saving lives, doing good deeds. Ah, oh, Mavis. Well, I'll be happy to do that, and I'll go over and uh, put something on. Let's see, uh, maybe something where I could uh, show off some uh, dance moves from my dance classes that I took uh, when I was dating that other girl back in uh, in uh, New York. Uh, to your surprise, there's some Louis Armstrong on the jukebox. Um, while it's, it's that kind of music is very popular up in New York, you didn't really think it had uh, grown much of a following in Alabama. But Louis Satchmo is on there. You can put him on. Excellent. Yeah, why don't I put some of that swinging uh, trumpeters music on? There's a, a few people nodding their heads, tapping their feet, mostly young people. Uh, some of the older folks in here are shaking their head. They just don't get the... Can't get the hang of this uh, up-tempo jazz. Is there any girl I can pull up and uh, do a few moves with? Just for fun. Why not? Uh, there's a girl, you don't know her. Uh, she's probably about ten years younger than you. But uh, she looks game for a dance. All right, let's have a bit of fun then. and Swing around a little bit. She introduces herself to you as Joni Fisher. She's uh, oh, she's only just arrived in town herself, but uh, she's she's up for a good time. She's here visiting uh, some family, much like yourself, in fact. Pleasure to meet you, Joni. Seems like we got some things in common then. And uh, you up for a little, a little swing around the dance floor, just showing these people how we do it out uh, outside of town. <laughs> I surely am. Let's make you roll some dice. To see how well you dance. Hmm, I think athletics. 
Athletics and dexterity would make sense. Well, I got one ten. Yeah, you dance a lot better than most of the people in here could. And uh, Joni matches you beat for beat with the same number of successes. Uh, And so, yeah, there's a bit of clapping, a bit of hooting and hollering and general support for your dance moves. And once the song comes to an end, a small round of applause. And you hear from Mavis, oh, it's good to have you back home, BC. Well, it's good to be here. And I go around as uh, she comes out with the uh, cake and the pie and uh, sit down to have some coffee and some something to eat. And uh, I say I thank uh, thank her for the dance, of course, as well. Don't want to be uh, unmannered. Joni, very shy, uh, but she thanks you as well and goes back to her friends. Before she leaves you entirely, she does say to you, uh, "BC, ain't it?" That's right. That's your name. Uh, Benny Clyde Rosberg. You could call me BC like my friends here. Well, BC, I, I was asked to come back here by my family, but and this is very embarrassing. I haven't been able to find them since I got here. I, I, I went by their house and they all appear to be out. I only got here this morning, so I thought maybe they were out fishing or shopping or something like that. Uh, if you could put the word around that Joni's back in town looking for her family, uh, the Fisher family, I, I would be ever so grateful. Right now, I guess I'm just going to have to stay up in the hotel, but I don't have much money to my name. And these friends I'm with right now are people I've only just met today, so I don't really want to impose on them neither. Well, uh, seeing as she is perhaps a little bit low, a little bit more low key than the Nod, despite her flashy dance moves, I I raise my voice and. Uh, uh, I say to everyone, sorry to uh, sorry to uh, grab even more attention from you this fine day, but uh, we got uh, Joni Fisher here back in town looking for a family who might not be home. So if anyone knows anything about that, please let us know. Uh, she'll be uh, staying uh, at our house for a little while until she can find them. You hear a um, lots of yeah, yeah, you know, we'll tell you, uh, and but you do hear on the edge of that. Fisher, fish bait more like. And who was that saying that? There's an old guy, looks like a scarecrow down the far end of the bar. Yeah. I'm not gonna respond to that not straight away. I'm gonna have my pie and cake, and then maybe I'd uh, wanna question him a little bit about what he meant. Charlie is getting quite irate at this point. Yeah. So, rather just trying to uh, get to our pie and our cake and. Uh, then have a look and see what Charlie wants to show us. See if there's anything there up by the drain pipe. You eat. The food is good. Mavis makes small talk with you about the town. Is there anything in particular you want to be asking? Well, um, I want to ask if, uh, uh, well, how people are doing, if uh, there's anything strange been happening lately, if things are going on as they should. Oh, no, nothing strange going on here at all, BC. You know, you hear tales, but that's just people. Too idle, so their lips start flapping. Nothing strange going on in Denton. Nothing ever is. Yeah, okay. Uh, Heard anything about the uh, Johnson family? How are they doing now that the fishing is kind of out of the trade? Oh, the Johnsons all land on their feet. They've always been good people. Yeah, that's what I thought too when I heard as much. And I'm trying to think of anything else that we've encountered so far that would be interesting to hear about. Uh, I, I don't want to ask her about strange creatures living in her drain pipe. Uh, that'll just upset her or make a strange scene. If she doesn't start talking about something, I, I don't. I don't really gonna ask. How, how does she? How does she feel to me? Is she uh, a bit more upbeat than the uh, pa- last waitress we were meeting? Uh, let's go for an empathy and cunning as well, I think. Well, no, I don't get any success this time. I get two ones, though. Well, on two ones, you get the strong impression that Mavis is trying to flirt with you. 
She seems to be eyeing you up and down a lot. Maybe your grandstanding and making something of yourself has had a rather detrimental effect because she's not necessarily seeing you as a hero as much as a romantic prospect. Maybe she thinks you've been trying to impress her in the wrong way. Yeah, and I feel that... Uh, I feel a bit nervous now because if she starts... She, she's, she's, she could... She could uh, if I don't do the right thing, maybe she'll spread the wrong kind of uh, publicity about me. Uh, so uh, I, I feel like... I get noticeably nervous, and uh, I I try to finish my cake quickly, and sort of become a bit short in my uh, way of uh, speaking. She looks a bit confused by your reaction, and then shakes her head and says, "All oh, Rasbergs, all alike," and she walks off. <sighs> I draw a sigh of relief. Uh, <laughs> that could have gone could have gone bad, and I finish my coffee and uh, I turn over to Charlie. Yeah, 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 we're gonna... I'll have a look now. We'll have a look. It might not be there anymore. If it's not there now, then it probably wasn't there when we came. Let's have a look. He huffs and goes out. I uh, pay, of course, before I leave. Come back soon. We'll, we'll, we'll do, Mavis. All, always a pleasure. That scarecrow-looking fella isn't there anymore. I, uh grip my teeth a little bit at this. I uh, wanted to ask him about what he meant, but maybe maybe that was an indication what something actually bad happened to that family. But um, still, I I give Joni my address, and I say that uh, she's free to come over and uh, and uh, stay there. We uh, we my yeah, it's, it's it's no trouble at all while she tries and find her parents. She's very grateful for the hospitality. Will you need a ride there, or uh, will you be fine getting there later? Well, I'll, I'll wait around a bit longer. My parents' house ain't far from here, so I'll check again in a couple of hours, and I guess if they still ain't back, I'll uh, I'll make my way to yours. Do you want to tell me where your parents' house is? She, um, she points it out. It's a, a couple of streets away. It is in Denton proper. It's not one of the houses out in the woods. Yeah, okay. Well, I'll note that down as well. And, uh, then I'll go out after Charlie was probably running ahead at this point. Yeah, he's already pretty much got his head in the drain. He seems to be calling into it, but you can't make out the words. What are you doing? He extracts his head from the drain. He says, I'm trying to get it to come back. He's got his smile on his face. You talking to it now? Well, he looks shy. I was singing to it mostly. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, isn't that nice? And I go over and I pick my head down there. Carefully now. I'm a bit... Considering what's been happening lately, I'm a bit cautious. You don't thrust uh, your head completely into the drain but you do take a good look do an integrity and cunning please uh, it's an 8 and a 9 while you can't see anything you can definitely hear a very similar sound to that gurgling you heard down in the caves oh and that kind of puts my hairs on edge I squint down there, and uh, I turn slowly over to Charlie. Then and say, "Very good, Charlie. This uh, might be something, might be something worth investigating." And I go over to my car and uh, get a get a flashlight. As you get the flashlight from the car, you can see that a few people have exited the diner and are coming down towards you, including Mavis and. Uh, a couple of other locals that you recognize. Yeah, okay, so I don't want to stand there like a fool poking my head in a drain pipe. Um, and I uh, move over to them. Did you find anything? Well, uh, I've been told by little Charlie here that he's uh, seen something uh, down in the drain pipe. Something uh, kind of strange, and uh, I thought I might as well give it a look, since now I'm a deputy in town, so, uh... Oh, go right ahead, deputy. Have you seen anything yourselves? 
Oh, no, no, we ain't seen nothing. Just heard the rumors. Do you mind if we come with you? No, no, of course. Uh, let's uh, let's uh, have a look together. I'm sure sure there's nothing there. I, it might be some some kind of lost animal or something. And I go over and uh, I try to shine the torch down there. Why don't you take a good look, deputy? At which point the locals move to grab you by the arms on either side. And Charlie tries to give you a shove in the back as they try and force you down into the drain. You have listened to an episode of Red Moon Roleplaying where we played the campaign Terror at Makeout Point for They Came From Beneath the Sea. Our Game Master was the Gentleman Gamer, Matthew Dawkins, who also created the game. They Came From Beneath the Sea is published by Onyx Path Publishing, and we would like to extend a big thank you to them and to Matthew for doing this actual play project with us. The music for this episode is taken from the Cryo Chamber collaborations Cthulhu, Yogg-Sothoth, Azathoth, Shabnigarath, and Nyarlathotep, and is used with permission from Cryo Chamber. Please check out cryochamber.bandcamp.com or their YouTube channel for more of their lovely dark ambient. Finally, a big thank you to all of our Patreon backers. Creating all of this content would not be possible without your generous support on Patreon. You give us loads of energy, you help us cover our costs, and you open up time for us to record and edit. So, from the bottom of our hearts, thank you ever so much. See you again soon.